This is fire engine number one. It is a rocket-propelled sled used for making deceleration tests at Holloman Air Development Center, Alamogordo, New Mexico. The man being strapped in is Colonel John Paul Stapp, Air Force scientist in charge of these experiments. Information obtained from the tests in this sled will be used to redesign aircraft seats and safety belting, affording pilots and passengers greater protection against jolts in emergencies. Six rockets developing 27,000 pounds of thrust hurled the sled down the 3,500-foot steel rails. In the forward section, crewmen fastened Colonel Stapp in with a network of belts and straps. Metal scoops underneath the sled act as brakes when they come in contact with water troughs at the far end of the track. X hour, and the sled is fired. High-speed cameras reveal Colonel Stapp's face at the peak of deceleration which is approximately 22 times the pull of gravity. The moment of peak deceleration comes in the first 10 feet after the brake scoops hit water. The impact of meeting the water trough disengages the after section of the sled where the rockets are located. The forward section drifts on to a halt. Completing his dangerous ride, Colonel Stapp, apparently none the worse for his experience, calmly unstraps himself anxious to know the results of the test. He doesn't know he's made history. Termed by press representatives the fastest man on Earth, Colonel Stapp learns he has just traveled 421 miles per hour. In future experiments, he plans to step it up a bit. Somewhere in the Pribilofs, a young seal wakes from a peaceful sleep, aroused by his animal instinct. Man has come. Within an instant, the entire herd is alert and ready to scatter should the cameraman prove dangerous. Life in Alaska is not an easy way of existence, and the men and creatures who dwell there are a special breed apart. The forbidding terrain and rugged living demand it. With only one person for every five square miles, Alaska is by far the most thinly settled of U.S. lands. Peopled by Eskimos, salmon fishermen, miners, and lumbermen, this far northern outpost is nevertheless one of America's most valuable possessions. From earliest youth, these hardy people have lived a primitive life, the biggest part of which has been devoted to hunting, fishing, and trapping. Their clothing, dog sleds, and homes have been produced by hand labor. This is the little village of Kotzebue in the northernmost reaches of the peninsula. The Eskimo families who live here are typical of the natives in similar communities throughout the territory. There are approximately 33,000 Eskimos in Alaska today. Even in this remote area, there are a few merchants who have gone into business and the Eskimos purchase some items from them. Ready to depart for two weeks active duty with the National Guard, this young man of Katsibu bids his mother goodbye. As in any small community, word spreads rapidly that our young guardsman is on his way to camp and good wishes are offered. Soon to be picked up by military aircraft and flown to Camp Richardson just outside Fairbanks, our Eskimo scout leaves the village behind and heads for lonely Ralph Ween Memorial Airport in the dog sled of a friend. In this land of scattered settlements and roadless regions, the air transportation method is often the only means of rapid travel. Otherwise, dog sleds are the only available conveyance. Just like our young Kotzebue guardsmen, all over Alaska, other guardsmen are on their way reporting for duty. Living in these isolated areas has not deterred thousands of Alaskans from joining the National Guard. All over the great Northern Territory, guardsmen board the shuttling aircraft in this unique once a year pickup operation. Finally reaching the Army post at Fort Richardson, their annual encampment begins. 
In the company areas, old friendships are renewed and the inevitable briefing by the top kick takes place. It's all new once again. In a land where the weather is unpredictable and temperatures range from 70 below to 100 above, you've got to know your weapons. New scouts get some special coaching here. Already possessed of unusual knowledge of the terrain and the climate, these scouts are nevertheless drilled in tactical fundamentals. Bivouac and field maneuvers are designed to increase scout proficiency and briefing sessions are thorough. H hour arrives and clad in their traditional white snow uniforms, the Eskimo battalion moves out. Hunters by profession, these native scouts enjoy every moment of their field exercises and have outstanding scores. Just practice now, but any aggressor meeting these elusive men in white out on the jagged ice fields would find it rough going. The strategic importance of Alaska to our nation's military forces is second to none. Guarding this Arctic gateway against aggression is a full-time job, and the Eskimo scouts of the Alaska National Guard are helping to fulfill that mission. The best known buildings in Frankfurt, Germany, houses the United States Army's Criminal Investigation Detachment in residential Schumannstrasse. Here is the headquarters of one of the three crack army detection units, the 27th Military Police Criminal Investigation Laboratory. What were formerly bedrooms and drawing rooms are now chemical analysis, ballistics, and lie detector laboratories. In an average day, the laboratory receives more than 150 different items for analysis. A typical case, here reenacted and requiring the help of the crime lab, had its start in nearby Darmstadt. The night previous, a roadblock was set up by MPs and local police officials to intercept a band of suspected black marketeers. In breaking through the barrier, members of the gang shot and seriously wounded an American MP. The getaway car, stolen weeks earlier, was found abandoned a few miles from the scene. Any investigation under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Army Europe falls within the domain of the Frankfurt Crime Lab. Like the omniscient detectives of fiction, men of the Criminal Investigation Division handle a wide variety of cases. But today, electronic microscopes augment the magnifying glass. Radar and spectroscopes aid the lugubrious but dependable bloodhound. As soon as the evidence is received, our military crime busters go into action. When the first pieces of the puzzle are put together in the chemical analysis laboratory, no bit of evidence is too small for analysis. Nothing so seemingly commonplace that it is not put through the most exacting scientific examination. The discovery of one small new detail will often crack a baffling case. Whether evidence in criminal cases comes from a provo marshal in England or a field investigator in Trieste, it is examined promptly, carefully, and with but one purpose the swift detection and arrest of the criminal. In the Darmstadt case, the abandoned automobile provides many valuable clues. Examination by experts of a pair of shoes left in the trunk may give information about the wearer's duties or occupation, depending on the way the shoe was worn. Scissors from the glove compartment provide a different route of investigation. They may be traced to the manufacturer, to the store where sold, and finally, perhaps, to the buyer. By using an X-ray diffraction machine, unknown substances like poisons, dusts, stains, and liquids can be identified. When X-rays pass through different kinds of substances, the crystals in the analyzed specimen diffract the X-rays in particular patterns. Later, by comparing the pattern on a graph with a pattern made by a known substance, the identity of the specimen is determined. In this case, an examination of stains found on the upholstery of the automobile seats proved to have been made by a specific kind of grease, an all-weather lubricant used on army vehicles and not on civilian automobiles. This information in itself may be of little value, but when added to other small clues, 
the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle begin to fall into place. The interpretation of evidence is just as important as uncovering clues. An army automatic unearthed by a farmer has been turned over to the 27th Firearms Identification Section. The question, did this gun fire the bullet which wounded the military policeman at the Darmstadt roadblock? A positive answer could be crucial in the case. A firing chamber of sheet steel filled with cotton waste is used for the test fire of the weapon in question. The spent bullet is recovered in an undamaged state. As the bullet passed through the barrel of the gun, distinctive markings are made on the speeding metal. Will these markings match those on the slug taken from the chest of the wounded MP? The two bullets are placed side by side under a high-powered microscope. For the record, microphotographs of the two bullets are made by a camera attachment. This evidence may later be submitted in court. The microphotographs reveal that the same weapon fired both bullets. Evidence like this is checked and double-checked by technicians who have shown time and again personal and professional ability and integrity, and who have testified before military and civilian courts as expert witnesses. Of immense value to the 27th MPC Laboratory's investigations is the fingerprint identification section. Here, all subjects and suspects have their fingerprints recorded. Because no two sets of fingerprints are ever alike, this method of establishing identity is equally important in confirming a man's innocence as it is in pointing toward his guilt. In the Darmstadt case, carefully trained investigators went over the abandoned car inch by inch. One good print was obtained a clear impression on the rear view mirror. A comparison of this print is made with those taken from one of the suspects. No method is more helpful in establishing innocence or guilt than spectrographic analysis. Today, with the help of such devices, criminals are convicted who a few years ago would have gone free. The spectrograph's functions are many, but none more important than the analysis and identification of particles of paint. Countless hit-and-run cases have been solved with the spectrograph's help. Now, though his fingerprints don't match, the suspect's clothing, the knee of his trousers, shows a trace of paint, matching exactly the paint on the dashboard of the abandoned Darmstadt automobile. Although evidence obtained by using a lie detector is not admissible in military courts, this machine is extremely helpful in furnishing leads to investigators. Basically, the lie detector operates by recording changes in the blood pressure of the person questioned, in this case, an actor. A truthful answer is accompanied by little or no change. A lie brings about a definite upsurge. Its use demands a special technique, alternating simple questions with others right to the point. Did you have breakfast this morning? Yes. Were you in Darmstadt on the 12th of this month? No. Have you been in the army more than a year? Yes. Have you ever stolen a car? No. After a certain period of questioning, the suspect's responses fall into a certain pattern. The ups and downs of his response to the questioning is recorded on a graph. Though it will never appear in court, this suspect's answers call for further investigation. In the European command, there have been many cases of counterfeiting, not only of military scrip and other currencies, but of PX cards and American Express checks. Experienced laboratory technicians have detected and run down the source of many counterfeit checks and currencies. Every example of the counterfeiter's work is kept on file for future reference. In the possession of the chief suspect in the Darmstadt case were found a small number of counterfeit bills. By cross-checking, investigators find that the money is the work of a counterfeiter known to have operated in northern France. It now appears obvious that the counterfeiter has opened new offices in the Frankfurt-Darmstadt area. With this new evidence, charges against the prisoner are growing. Because it is the burden of the prosecution to prove guilt, never the task of the defense to prove innocence, every scrap of evidence available must be carefully recorded, identified, and prepared for exhibition in court. The crime lab photographic section 
is of invaluable assistance in providing graphic reproduction of evidence to assist the court in reaching its decision. Every bit of evidence in the Darmstadt case, from an empty cognac bottle found in the back seat of the stolen car, to the shirt worn by the military policeman shot at the roadblock, is photographed for future presentation. Although the primary mission of the laboratory is the analysis and testing of items in connection with criminal investigations, the personnel frequently leave the laboratory and cooperate with local police officials by making field tests in the vicinity of Frankfurt. When the final report on the Darmstadt case is written, it has been proven once more that no matter how new the criminal's approach to a crime, the 27th Military Police Criminal Investigation Laboratory is always two scientific steps ahead of him. <laughs>